Hello, and thank you for tuning in to First Baptist Church of Conway. I'm Rocky Taylor, one of the pastors here, and it is our prayer that this will be a resource to help you grow in faith in Jesus and to know His love for you. This video contains the sermon as well as one or two songs from this week's service, and while we are glad to provide this resource, it is not a substitute for being a part of a weekly fellowship of believers with whom you can worship and share life with. I hope to see you here at First Baptist next Sunday at 10 a.m. May God bless you as you remain faithful to Him. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is healing. I know the Spirit of the Lord is living in me. Good morning. I'm glad to be here with you as we start this new year with a new series titled Spiritual Disciplines. I figured this would be a great time to talk about the things, uh, some new things for us for 2022, some things that could make our year perhaps a great year, uh, hopefully a much better year. I think by now we figured out there's so many things we can't control. Have we learned that lesson yet? 
Yeah, I think by now we've all learned, all right, there's a lot out of our control, so perhaps we can talk about the things we can control, mainly ourselves. And that's what the spiritual disciplines are all about. It's the things that we can do to prepare us for the things that God wants to do. It's the things we can do in our lives, the activities we can take to prepare us for the things God wants to do in our lives and the things He's asking us to do. There are activities that help us become more effective in cooperation with Christ and His kingdom. And I have to admit, for a long time, I, uh, my approach to the spiritual disciplines, well, I did them because I was supposed to do them. Or like I, I knew I had to pray, I, I had to read my Bible. I was told they were important, but I never knew why, so I did them for the activities in themselves. And any time I prayed, or how about this, any time I didn't read the Bible or any time I didn't pray, I would feel, feel guilty. And even if I did pray or I did read my Bible, I'd feel guilty that I didn't do it enough. Right? It was always this thing of guilt, almost shame. I feel like maybe I didn't do it long enough. Maybe I didn't pray long enough. Have you ever felt like that? Or when you approach the spiritual disciplines, they kind of have like this weight, this burden, this guilt attached to them. Many people struggle with this, and perhaps you, well, like me, just misunderstood the whole purpose of them in general. You see, the spiritual disciplines aren't supposed to be a checklist of activities we do. They're not supposed to be a religious meter for us to gauge how good and how righteous we really are. You see, that's the type of thing that the Pharisees did, right? They're found out all throughout the Gospels. They, they participate in these activities, and I think we do it too. The more I do them, the better I must be. The more I read the Bible, the more righteous I must be. And this leads to the idea that I must be more righteous than everybody else because I read my Bible more than everybody else. I must be more righteous because I pray more than other people. However, when you come to the New Testament or any of the, uh, excuse me, the, the New Testament or the Gospels, all of them are consumed with this inward type of change, not this outward appearance and behavior. You see, Jesus wasn't impressed with the checklist. See, the people all throughout the scriptures, the Pharisees, the opponents of Jesus, they had these massive checklists. They, their religious meter was filled. They were doing all the things they were supposed to do. And on the outside, and from outward appearances, it looked like, well, these just must be holy, righteous, religious people. Look what Jesus says about them. Matthew uh, 23, verse 27. Yep, here it is. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And so Jesus clearly was after more than behavior modification. Jesus was interested in heart change, life change, Paul talks about becoming this new person from the inside out, not from the outside in. And see, Jesus was never impressed by these outward appearances and actions. He wants inward change, character change. And the radical idea I had to embrace, all right, this, is, this was radical to me, maybe for you, is that the disciplines in themselves don't do anything. The disciplines don't do anything. Only God does something. And it's a radical thought, and we probably know this already, is that I can't change me. In fact, the more I try to change me, the more I find out what? Boy, I'm a lot worse than I thought. You ever notice that? The more good you try to do, the more you realize you can't do it. And you realize how bad you really are. The more I try to change me, it doesn't work. Only God can change me. To quote Richard Foster, he says this, he says, by themselves, the spiritual disciplines can do nothing. Nothing. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. 
And I hope that idea resonates. I hope you can think through that. It takes a long time for this to sink in. At least it did for me. I mean, a long time for me to finally grasp what he's teaching here. You see, the spiritual disciplines are a grace. They're an avenue for us to place ourselves before God, humble ourselves before God, so God can do the transformation work. The disciplines in themselves don't transform us. They take us to the person who can transform us. They bring us into the presence of God and allow us to depend and humble ourselves before Him. In other words, the goal of Bible reading isn't to read the Bible. The goal of Bible reading is to know God, to meet with Him. The purpose of praying isn't to pray. It's to communicate with God. You see, I should never feel guilty about not reading the Bible. But perhaps, perhaps I should feel something if I'm uninterested in spending time with God. That's a different thing, isn't it? It's one thing for not reading the Bible. It's another thing if I just don't want to hear from God. I shouldn't feel guilty about praying. But perhaps I should feel embarrassed that I don't want to talk with God. And I think I can shoulder all these issues on my own. Do you see the difference there? One is the activity, the other is focused on God. And the whole point of the spiritual disciplines are get us to commune and focus on God. It's not about the activity itself, it's about what it's taking us to or who it's taking us to. You see, the spiritual disciplines aren't the goal, they are a means to the end. And the end, of course, is to know God, to talk with God, develop intimacy with Him. Foster says, to know the mechanics does not mean that we are practicing the disciplines. The spiritual disciplines are an inward and spiritual reality, and the inner inner attitude of the heart is far more critical than the mechanics for coming to the reality of the spiritual life. And this is why some of the meanest people you've ever met before in your life know the most Bible. You ever met them? You're like, yeah, it was my granddad, right? You've met them. They know so much about the Bible, and you go, something's off. You can quote it, you can use it, but it doesn't seem to have transformed or done anything in your life. When we look at the disciplines as a righteous meter, we miss the entire point. That's legalism at its finest. That's works righteousness at its finest. Thinking we can do something to make ourselves better rather than understanding that we do them to encounter the living God who wants to transform us and use us. So, spiritual disciplines. We don't practice them, so God puts a gold star by our name. Y'all teachers used to do that in school? Y'all are way too quiet for me today. (laughs) like, I gotta know you're tracking a little bit or we'll start over. Right, so we don't do them. Like, it's not, God doesn't have a daily checklist, puts a gold star by our name, say, "Good, good boy. We don't do them because of that. They are activities that take us to the place where we lay ourselves before God. We lay ourselves before God in this broken world and say, God, use me, transform me, change me. They're the things we do to cooperate with God in this world because on the other side, this world is broken and sinful. Did you know that? Did you know that this world is broken and sinful and the reality is? Let's be honest. It's easy to sin, isn't it? Y'all find it easier, just me. All right, again, I'll start all over again. We're going to have a conversation. Do we need to list out what sin is so I can make sure we're all on the same page? Right. It's easy to sin. It comes natural to all of us. And when we think about sin or talk about sin, we generally talk about it in terms of right and wrong choices. Like sin is a wrong choice I made against God. But what's interesting is the Bible paints a very different picture of sin. The Bible doesn't paint the picture of sin as just this one wrong choice I make. The Bible paints the picture of sin as something wrong we do, but it's also this power, this internal thing that has power over our lives. Sin isn't just this wrong choice, it's that sin lives within us and has this power over us. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. He says, what shall we conclude then? 
Do we have any advantage? No, not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles, that's all of us, alike, are all under the power of sin. And according to Paul, and verified by at least my personal experience, we know sin is more than just a wrong choice. Sin is powerful. Sin is within us. And we can sum it up to say, and I think we'd agree, agree we are sinful people. It's so easy and so natural. But the good news, of course, is that Jesus Christ came to deal with that. He came to deal with sin. And while we usually focus on the fact that He came to die for sin, to pay the penalty of sin, to justify us, all that is true. All those who believe they are saved from the penalty and the consequences of sin, there's another thing about His death that we probably don't talk about enough is that His death and resurrection, of course, saves us for heaven and to be with Him, but it also breaks the power of sin in our lives. If you've never read it, read Romans chapter 6. Paul deals with it in great detail there. But look what he says about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in light of sin. He says this. He says, For sin shall no longer be your master. Isn't that great news? Because you are not under the law, but under grace. Look what he says in verse 18. He sums it up. He says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. See, through Jesus Christ, because of what he's done and through our faith in him, we have been set free from sin, that it no longer has to be this controlling thing in our lives, meaning we don't have to sin. We now choose to sin, the Christian does. Because you aren't drawn to it, you have this other power, this other person, the Holy Spirit living within us, which means we can actually overcome sin problems. Which is why Peter says this. Look at what Peter says. He says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. How many of y'all have figured out how to do that yet? Yeah, that, that's the challenge why would, the, why would the Bible tell us to do things that we absolutely can't do? That would make no sense. So we strive. He says, behold, you're no longer under the power of sin. It no longer controls you. It's no longer your master. You can do something with it, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is the life we're called to, Christian, to be holy. We're not talking about specific jobs or specific ministries. We're, called, we're talking about the idea that all of us are called to be holy because God's holy. We're called to become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. All of us, all of us should be striving for change. And change is the one thing all of us are adverse to, aren't we? But all of us are called to change, unless, of course, you are Jesus. Unless you're already holy. Jesus was holy, therefore we are called to be holy. And that sums up the conflict that every single Christian deals with. Sin is natural, sin is easy. And the fact the more we try not to sin, the more we realize how big of sinners we actually are. But the good news is Jesus came to save us from sin. He came to save us from the penalty of it, but he also came to break the power of sin in your life. We no longer have to be slaves to it. We now have a choice. And as children of God, being born again, we are called to live as the light to this dark world. We're called to be holy. We're called to be ambassadors to reach the last, the least, and lost. We're called to be like Jesus Christ. Which is where those spiritual disciplines come in to help us. The spiritual disciplines clear the fog of sin, if you will. They clear the fog of sin. They take us to the presence of Jesus Christ so we can grow in intimacy with our Father, be developed and changed into Him. So we do our part so God can do His part. It's the paradox of our faith. Look at Philippians 12. Paul says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're like, all right, that's, that's what we do this? He's like, yeah, but no. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to fill His good purposes. Working out our salvation is our effort in the spiritual life. Since we can't be saved, excuse me, since we cannot work out being saved, 
he must be talking about working out our salvation, meaning allowing the full effects of what Jesus Christ has done to reign in our lives, to work out that sin problem, let it take over. That is, to be holy, we strive. This is the effort that we put into our spiritual life. It takes discipline. Look at what Paul says in 1 Timothy. He says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. How many of us like discipline? Yep, I figured. I was going to call this 2022, the year of discipline. I said, well, no one's going to cheer for that at all, so I'm just going to not say it. But the year of discipline. And as Americans, we have a radically hard time being disciplined because there's an overabundance of everything all the time. And so while I'm all for the reformation of the biblical truth that we're saved by grace through faith, grace never meant that we're supposed to be lazy. I love this quote from Dallas Willard. He says this. He said, currently we're not only saved by grace, but we're paralyzed by it. That should sting, by the way. That should sting hard. He goes on to say, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning Earning is an attitude. Effort is action. We can't earn our way into heaven like with this attitude that I'm entitled. But boy, we can work out our salvation because of what Jesus Christ has done. And I've been trying to figure out for a long time how to articulate that. We're saved by grace for sure. We can't earn our salvation because quite simply, we can't do what Jesus did. So we can't earn it because we can't do it. We can't be the perfect God-man to come down and die on a cross and then resurrect ourselves. At least I can. Any of y'all got that in you? Right, so we can't earn salvation at all. But it's more than going to heaven. Salvation breaks the power of sin. And that's what we're called to do, to live these holy lives, to work out the salvation, to take, to go to the place where God is so He can transform us and work in us. In other words, living a holy, righteous life doesn't happen automatically. I bet you already knew that, though, didn't you? Sin happens automatically. Because we're in a sinful, broken world. That, that's automatic. But holiness takes effort. And this is where the spiritual disciplines come into play. It's understanding that the world is broken. We live in a sinful world, and we have all developed uh, sinful habits and practices. And the spiritual disciplines are the things we do behind the scenes, those practices that allow us to go before God so He can transform and develop us. The disciplines in themselves are not the goal. It's the life change from them, what God will do through them, the avenues that God has ordained to say, hey, here's, here's some things to bring you closer to me. Here's some things and actions you can do to come up, be a part, and join me. Now, Richard Foster's Celebration of Disciplines, probably the most complete work I've read on the subject. Um, it's, it's pretty much a Christian classic already. You could pick it up, read it on your own, just to let you know it's a little dry for my taste. Some of you intellectual people, y'all be like, oh, this is amazing and awesome. This is, it's a little above my league, but it's a great breakdown. I mean, it's a great book to go back and look at stuff. So if you don't have the book, you should buy it. But he, he breaks down the disciplines and I think, three amazingly helpful areas. He says you have the inward disciplines, the outward disciplines, and the corporate disciplines. Inward, outward, and corporate. And if we take these serious, it will allow us to tap in to the spiritual power that's available in Christ Jesus. And perhaps we can't do them all, and I get that. But perhaps we can pick up some. Perhaps those things that'll fit with your personality and your style. For instance, I've been told for years, a lot of great Christians, they do journaling. I'm going to let you know something. I hate journaling. Like it, it doesn't fit. Jesus didn't say, I have to journal. But what we do learn is that a lot of people get a lot out of journaling. It's for them. It works for them. I can't even read my own writing. Anybody else here with me? It, it doesn't help. I don't appreciate. So what I'm saying is when we look at the spiritual discipline, some of them we just have to do. Some are obviously more important than others. But you want to pick up some. Let 2022 be the year of trying things out. Christian things out. Let's try out some of these disciplines, see which ones stick, see which ones work for our lives. 
So the inward ones are the ones we're going to talk about today, and we're going to spend um, the, the ones you're probably the most familiar with. I'm going to briefly go over them, and we'll spend more time talking about the others, which we're probably not as familiar with. The first one is Christian meditation. How many of y'all meditate doing yoga? Everybody's like, well, hold on. Is that a trick question? It was. It was fun. Meditation, right? There is a such thing as Christian meditation. If you didn't know, it's a spiritual discipline. Christian meditation is generally, excuse me, meditation in general is generally, um, excuse me, my notes are messed up. Meditation in general is popular today. We know that, right? Because of yoga and other practices that have creeped in. But meditation is also a Christian thing and always has been a Christian thing. There's a big difference between the meditation you learn maybe in yoga or other practices because Eastern meditation is an attempt to empty the mind. Y'all heard of that? We need to empty and clear. But Christian meditation is an attempt to fill the mind. There's a big difference. We don't try to clear it out and put nothing in there. We try to fill it up and put the things of God in our minds. For the Christian We want to fill our minds with God's Word. The idea in the Bible of meditation has uh, many different nuances. It's listening to God's Word, reflecting on God's Word, rehearsing God's deeds, and deeply thinking about His law like for the Old Testament. But the purpose of meditation is always to encounter the living God and repent and obey. It's always to chew on God's word, to think about God, to think about what he's doing. Listen for God with the purposes of changing, repenting, and obeying. Meditation is preparing ourselves to hear from God. Foster says, Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. Can you hear God when he talks? Would you be amazed to know that God is still speaking today, always has been, he's alive and active, that sometimes we just have earmuffs on? We just clog it up? God is still revealing, God is still speaking to us today. And that's what meditation is about, to hear him. It's where, it's the devotional life for the Christian, the internalization and personalization of God's word in our lives. So do you have a quiet time? Do you have a time that you just sit down to hear from God? To meditate on the things of God? A lot of different, um, excuse me, a lot of different application-centered material will be helpful, those, those devotionals. And of course, you know, just Google it, there's a ton of different devotional material out there. But it's that daily quiet time saying, Lord, I want to listen to you. I'm here. I want to hear today from you. So we have Christian meditation. Next up is prayer. Who's heard of prayer? We've heard of that one, right? Just seven of us, huh? All right. So Christian prayer, we know what that is. Prayer is the communication with God where we communicate and talk with the creator of the universe. And before we go any further, have you thought about how amazing that is? That we are able, we as Christians believe that we can actually talk to the creator. That he listens to us. That he wants us to talk with him. How many of you would be impressed if your favorite artist or your favorite movie star or your favorite politician, if you have one right now, how many of you would be amazed if they wanted to talk to you? How excited would you be if that favorite artist said, hey, let's have a conversation. You'd get all giddied up. Chuck put on a special cowboy hat. He'd get all fired up for this meeting. What about the creator of the universe? Let's come talk to me. I want to meet with you. I want to talk with you. He's extended that that invitation. And could it be if the number one goal for all of us is to change, to be more like Christ? Could it be that a lack of prayer in our life is the reason why we're so resistant to change? I love this quote by Foster. He says, to pray is to change. Prayer 
Oh, nope, go back. Yep, prayer is to change. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. If we are unwilling to change, we will abandon prayer as a noticeable characteristic of our lives. And I think he's right. Because prayer is when we talk to God. And if God wants us to change and become holy, I think we all agree we're not that. And if that's God's primary thing he wants to do in our lives, just change us and transform us, then the reason why we'll quit talking to him is because we don't want to change. We don't want to be transformed. We really don't want to hear what he has to say. It's kind of gut-wrenching, isn't it? When we understand what it is and why we do them. You see, as we, we are all called to live holy lives, we are reminded through the Gospels, though, that prayer isn't an automatic thing. It's a spiritual thing. We must learn how to pray. We must be reminded of the importance of prayer and the power of prayer. Just read the Gospels and see Jesus, how he constantly prayed and sought the Father. And if he needed to do that, how much more do we need to do that? See, the disciples asked Jesus in Luke chapter 11, Lord, teach us to pray. We can do the same thing. Lord, teach us to pray. We have his prayers in the Bible. We have prayers of other people. But prayer is one of those things that's just assumed by Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And there's a lot of this stuff. Jesus says, and, what's that word? It's just assumed you're going to do it. And when you pray, because this is the things you do as Christians, you pray, you seek God. Prayer is assumed by Jesus because he was saturated in prayer, and so were all of the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ. Andrew Murray says this, and I've been chewing on this quote. I really love it. And I think it's, it's just powerful. He says, prayer is so simple that a feeble child can pray. We know that, right? Yet it, is at, yet it is at the same time the highest and holiest work to which a man can rise. I just, I just want, I want to experience that. This is one of the things I'm working on for 2022. I want to be better at prayer. Just being honest, right? You be honest with each other. I, 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 want, I want to experience that highest and holiest work. Well, now am I coming to it selfishly? Now I got a whole lot of work to do on that. Now I just messed myself up. But I want to pray better. I want to pray more. I want to become a person of prayer. How about you? And I think it's okay because... It's so simple that a kid, but it's also the highest and holiest work. So perhaps we could all grow a bit in our prayer lives. Next up is your absolute favorite. Guess what it is? Fasting. How many of y'all love this one? Yeah, fasting is the least popular, most unpopular discipline in all of spiritual disciplines for Protestants. It's as if when the Reformation happened, we broke away from the Catholic Church. We left fasting there with them. We we're like, we don't like that. You can keep fasting. We're going to go ahead and do our own thing. And we'll call them potlucks, right? <laughs> we say, we're, we're going to choose potlucks over fasting. You keep that one to yourselves. But again, fasting is one of those things that Jesus just assumed. Just like praying. When you fast, do not. You can read the rest on your own. Fasting is one of those things just assume that we will continue to do. You see, the culture of Jesus' day didn't need to be told to pray. Because they already prayed. They didn't need to be told to fast. Because they already fasted. In fact, scholars say that they would fast, Jewish people would fast twice a week, every week. Fasting is a spiritual discipline. Fasting is the abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. And the best thing I've ever heard about fasting, the thing that made it click and helped me the most, is once again from Dallas Willard. He says, say no to the things you can. He says, fasting is saying no to the things you can, so you can learn to say no to the things you can't. Say no to the things you can, to learn to say no to the things you can't. And I don't know about you, but I've realized my no power isn't always the best. And so when you start learning the discipline of saying no to easier things, 
like that soda. Now, fasting is food, but we could take it all sorts of ways, right? But we, we work that no muscle so we can develop that, that, that yearning and that suffering and learn that it'll be okay to say no. I, I'll make it. In fact, I don't have to eat lunch. I, I, I can make it. Saying no to that hunger pain, that suffering. Because I don't know about you, when I feel a little bit of hungry, boy, I'm like, I got to eat now, I'm going to die. Like when I come home at 5 o'clock, I'm like, Jessica, I'm going to die. I haven't eaten like, like three hours and I'm going to die. Got to get un- that, that little hunger thing under control. Fasting helps us control those things. Fasting is a way we can build up those no muscles, and it's a key to these disciplines. And when we fast, we aren't just building up um, self-will and spiritual, I mean, excuse me, self-discipline, although that happens. When we fast, we're fasting for the purpose of going before God with that need. And so when I'm saying no to that hunger and I'm saying no to that thing, that hunger pain automatically triggers me to do what? Pray. Seek God depend upon God. When we say no to those things that we can't say no to, when we're fasting, we're like, hey, this has too much control in my life. I'm going to say no to it. And then when that desire, when that thing happens that makes me want that, I immediately go to God and give it to him. I immediately go to him and I sit at his feet and cry for his help and his mercy and his grace. Yeah, we all deal with stuff like that or should be. We all need to go before him and say, Lord, I can't do this. I need you. Lord, I can't do this. I need you. Please show up. So fasting develops us sitting at his feet. If you haven't tried it, go for it. You'd be amazed on how much you can actually do. If you've never tried fasting, give it a shot. There's all sorts of different fasts. Look some up on the internet. But try it out. Work that no muscle. Work that dependence upon God because you may find And you may be surprised how addicted and dependent on silly things we really are. So we give those to God. Next up, we have study. The Christian faith, and you probably knew this, but the Christian faith has always been a thinking faith. The Christian faith has always welcomed intelligent, smart people saying, come on, bring the best you got to the faith. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12 too. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, the primary way in which we renew our minds is through studying, through digging deep, thinking about the good things. Remember, that's what Paul commanded us to do to to get that peace of Christ, get that peace of God. We need to think and dwell on godly things. As we all know, at least I know, We don't have to train our minds to wander, be anxious, and worry, do we? Did you you ever have to read a book about how to worry? All right, here's the four steps you take. That just happens. That's the sinfulness. That's that stuff that God doesn't want in our life. Our brains will do that all on its own, so studying is the counter to that. It's dwelling and thinking about the things of God. God, to redirect our thoughts, which all of our thoughts need to be redirected, and retrain them to think about the godly things. You see, while I hope you trust in the things I teach you here, I would rather you fact check me. I'd rather you investigate every single thing I say and go study on your own. You see, as Christians, we believe there's truth. We believe you can find it. And here's what every single pastor's dream is. I promise you, all of us have the same dream. It's this, Acts 17. It says, this was Paul was teaching. It says, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character. More noble, all right? This is important. Watch how they were more noble. They were more noble character than those of Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures Every day to see if what Paul said was true. This is every pastor's dream. Fact check me. Go study on your own. I don't mind your emails. I get them all the time. Whether, whether you know that or not, I get them. I like them. I like it when I'm challenged theologically. When someone says, hey, I think you're wrong here. I'm like, good. Let's talk about it. I'll show you why you're wrong, because I'm right. That's just how that works. <clears throat> but I don't mind those emails. And I want you to study 
and think through the passages we go through. The reason why, generally, not this week, of course, but generally we have this big passage of Scripture and I show you all my work, and we walk through it verse by verse. Do you know why we do that? To show you you can do it too. We can all do it. We can all, if I can do it, I promise you, you can do it. Work through study, examine the Scriptures. Foster says, meditation is devotional. Study is analytical. Tricks that, it hits that other side of the brain. And maybe you can't study every single day. You can't dive deep every single day. But you can work through some stuff with your small group or Sunday school class. You can go through a book, a book and meditate and chew on it. The spiritual celebration disciplines. Buy the book. Study it. Think about it. Go through it. Of course you can study the Bible. But there's also great Christian books you can also study to help you think through subjects and work through those. And maybe studying's not easy for you. You're like, Brian, I just, the devotional stuff, I'm going to try that. But, you know, I've never really been that smart. I want you to know it's okay. It wasn't easy for me either. either. Do you know I didn't read my first book except for Goosebump? Anybody read Goosebump? That's showing my age. You're like, I bought them for my grandkids. I don't know what to tell you. I read Goosebump. So, I've stopped reading books in elementary school, Goosebump books, and I didn't read my first book until college. It's in the office. I meant to bring it in. I didn't read middle school, high school. I didn't read my first full book until college. It wasn't easy. I told you I'm not that smart. I just work hard. Any of y'all fake it? Yeah, I just work really hard. And what I found to be true, this is important, what I found to be true is the more I studied, the smarter I became. It was really weird. And it said the more I grew in this stuff, the easier it was. C.S. Lewis says this, and C.S. Lewis says, so it must be true. He says, one of the reasons why it needs no special education to be a Christian is that Christianity is an education in itself. See, Christianity teaches you to think. Christianity teaches you all sorts of different things. You see, half the books I read, I didn't understand at all. And over time, I could understand them. For instance, the book I'm quoting up here by Dallas Willard 10 years ago, I read it, and I was like, yup, I don't have a clue what this guy's saying, but my mentor told me to read the book, so I'm going to read it. 10 years later, I go back, I'm like, man, it's a good book. I got a bunch of highlights in here. I don't remember any of it. I had to go back and reread it because I just... It's easier now. It takes time. The reason why you see me quoting C.S. Lewis all the time now is because 15 years ago when I first read him, I didn't understand the thing that guy was saying. Like nothing. If you haven't read C.S. Lewis, give it a shot. And then try it again in 15 years. It may, I'm not joking. This time when I went through Dallas Willard's work, I understood about half. I'm hoping in 10 years, well, I'm going to get it down. I'm like, man, I got this now. I, I, I get this guy. I tell you this because study is one of the ones people are most adverse from. We think it's to the professionals. It is not. Christianity is never supposed to have been left to the professionals. It's always supposed to be for us. God gave his word for us to read and to study and to learn. And you can do it. You can study. You can learn. And so those are the inward disciplines for the spiritual life. We have the devotional, we have prayer, we have fasting, and we have studying. These are activities that we do to take us to the place where God can do his work. And can you imagine with me for a moment if all of us did this? Could you imagine a moment if just in your personal life you took this serious and really started thinking and dwelling on the things of God rather than, well, I don't know, Facebook, can you imagine if every Christian spent just as much time in the Bible as they did Facebook? We'd have scholars everywhere. It'd be amazing. Everybody would be up here preaching. What if we took it serious that God wants to meet with us, meet with you every single morning? God is saying, let's talk. Let's hang out. Hey, I already know what's happening today. I know you're busy, but I already know. How about you meet with me and we deal with some things before you go at it? You're like, nah, God, I got this. And we come home all miserable and messed up, don't we? He's like, well, I was, I was going to prepare you for that, but you just ignored me. 
He said, what if you just met with God every morning? What if you talked with him, communed with him, spent time together with him? Could you imagine if we overcame our sinful habits and instead of all that, we developed these spiritual habits to be in tune with God, to hear from God, to tap into that spiritual life, that spiritual power that the Bible says is readily available for us all. Can you imagine the difference we could make in our lives, in our children's, in our relationships, in our churches? Could you imagine the powerhouse this church would be for this community, for the glory of God? If we all just took the discipline serious, we developed a little discipline and said, I'm going to work on these things. I'm going to develop them and see what God can do with them. The truth is, I think we can do this together. And the way I'm asking us all to go through is with those emails I've been sending out about that new city catechism app. Y'all remember that? Y'all get those emails? Don't lie. We can check if you got them. You're like, yeah, I know if you opened them or not. You didn't know that? Absolutely do. I know how much time you spent reading. I'm just kidding. We don't have that much stuff. But look, that New City Catechism Catechism app, the reason why we're pushing, and I'm pushing now, I want to sell you on this, I want you to join with us as a church as we study the core doctrines of our faith. In this, you will have the devotional material. Did we talk about devotional stuff? We did, devotional spiritual habit. In that app, you have um, devotional, where you can look at what people say about these specific passages. You have specific passages of the Bible you can study. And you have a prayer in there that can lead you on this theological truth. You can then pray a prayer about that. And so the whole purpose of this study is for us to think through our faith, to become Um, to learn the doctrines of our faith, to say some prayers, and to really spend time with God. The only thing, as far as the inward discipline this app doesn't have, is fasting. Y'all want to come up with a plan? I figured we'd just leave that one alone for now. What do you think? We'll, We'll talk about that later. But as far as the app, I suggest you do it. Every week we're going to go over it, and I suggest every Sunday school to go over it. We're going to recite them here every Sunday morning during worship. And I'm going to call some of you on stage to give a presentation. (laughs) Anybody want to go first next week? All right, buddy, next week. You coming up here next week? You raised your hand. Yes or no? You and your dad? Jason, you going to do it with Evan next week? Oh, you're working. All right, how convenient. (laughs) You're like, I, I'm fighting fires, Brian. I don't know what to tell you. I can't, I can't help. That's fine. That's, that's spiritual. But next week, we're going to go through them. But for 2022, there's 52 weeks. So let's go through this journey together. You remember when we did the story, those of you who were here, so many of you talked about how it was great to be able to talk to your fellow church members about the different stories and the different things we're going through. This is the same way. This is the same thing. Let's go through it. Let's talk about it. Let's pray through them and learn the core doctrines of our faith and it's free again you can buy the books we'll send out another email tomorrow so take a look at it that explains this but the whole purpose of this app is to go along with us talking about the spiritual disciplines and remember the spiritual disciplines reading the app in themselves is not the point the point is so they can take you to a place where god can transform you they can draw you closer to him help you know more about him help you experience him in a different way And on that journey, you'll learn a ton. And I know God will do a lot with that. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that as we dive deep into this topic of spiritual disciplines, Lord, we just help and pray that through the power of your Spirit, you prompt us into practicing these things. To practicing um, praying to practicing reading our Bibles, to practice devotional material, to practice fasting. We just pray, Lord, that your Spirit prompts and helps us be bold enough to try these things out daily. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much that his salvation not only allowed us to spend eternal life and and spend eternity with you, but it allowed us to break, it broke the chain of sin in our lives to where we, we really can strive for holiness. We really can strive to be like you, Jesus. So help us, transform us through these daily practices. We're looking forward to meeting with you, Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.